more minutes. All right. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Wonderful. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming out on this uh, rainy day. I really appreciate seeing all these faces in the audience. Um, a quick word before we get started. There's going to be a little question and answer period at the end if you have any questions for our speaker, uh, anything like that. There are microphones that are going to be uh, in the aisle, at the end of each aisle. So if you'll just sort of line up and speak into those microphones. Uh, when you have a question. Does that sound good to everyone? Great. Right, and they're at the very back of the two central aisles here. Um, I am Nick Knowles. I'm a faculty member in the Department of uh, Psychological and Brain Sciences here at the University of Louisville. And uh, it's my pleasure to be the director of the Grawmeyer Award in Psychology. Uh, before we uh, get to our speaker, uh, and I'll be introducing her shortly, um, I just want to really quickly um, say a little bit about the award, because the, the Grawmeyer Award is actually a very special award in psychology. Um, first of all, um, I would like to thank the Grawmeyer family. We actually have members of the family here uh, uh, in the audience today, so we give them a round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so these awards were created in the late 80s by Charles Grawmeyer, who was a successful business person and actually an alum of UofL, right? So I know we have a lot of UofL students, a lot of maybe future UofL students uh, in the audience. Um, and and uh, his goal in making these awards was to make the world a better place. Uh, and there are two aspects of these awards that I think are really special, that are really unique about the Grawmeyer Award relative to any other award uh, that uh, is sort of handed out for, uh, to scientists. The first piece, the first thing that makes it special, is that the goal of the award is to recognize great ideas. Okay, so not achievement or how long you stay in the game or, or how visible you might be, but uh, having a great idea that has a big impact. All right, so that's one special aspect um, of this award. Uh, the second part of the award and I think, um, so the idea part is very important, but the second thing that makes it a really unique uh, award is it's not just sort of scientists and academics giving an award to another scientist or academic, okay? So Charles Grawmeyer had this idea that big ideas are for everyone, right? They change the world and, and everyone should be able to understand them. And so there are people who are non-scientists who are involved in the selection process, the, uh, process of uh, choosing the winner of this award, all right? So so there are scientists and academics involved, but there's also just regular people who are not in those fields who have to be able to understand and appreciate the idea on their own. And again, I think that's one thing that's really special about uh, the Grawmeyer Award, especially the Grawmeyer Award in psychology. Uh, this year's winner, uh, without, without uh, further delay, uh, is Dr. Terry Moffitt. So Dr. Moffitt uh, attended the University of uh, um, <coughs> Excuse me. University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill as an undergraduate and received her graduate training uh, at the University of Southern California where she earned a PhD in clinical psychology. Dr. Moffitt spent more than 20 years as a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin in Madison before accepting a uh, position as the Nan O. Cohan University Professor as of Psychology at Duke University in 2007 where she's still today. Uh, she also is a professor of social development at King's College London um, when I was preparing this, uh, I, I uh, was looking down her list of appointments and uh, impressed that one person could humanly do <laughs> all of these different things. So she has other appointments in addition to those. Uh, so she has a, a lot of jobs and wears a lot of hats. Um, Dr. Moffitt has also received uh, many, many awards uh, and honors and special recognitions for her work. Uh, unfortunately, it would really cut into her time if I were to actually list them all, but there's a lot. Um, I want to mention a couple of things because this is an award in psychology, that she would receive both the Early and Distinguished Career Awards in Psychology uh, from the American Psychological Association. She's also a fellow of many prestigious uh, societies, including the National Academy of Medicine and the British Academy. Uh, perhaps the most impressively, Dr. Moffat's honors uh, include recognition from different scientific fields. 
So she doesn't just have awards that psychologists are giving to another psychologist, um, but from other fields like uh, criminology and medicine and so on. So it's actually a, a very sort of impressive breadth of work. And I think that really represents Dr. Moffat's work. It's very interdisciplinary. It touches on lots of different domains. Uh, Dr. Moffat has expertise in longitudinal methods, developmental theory, mental health, neuropsychology, genomics, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, she's a key contributor to not one but two important large-scale longitudinal studies, and her work has been funded by education uh, by uh, many different uh, organizations, both in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, she's the author of more than 400 publications, according to Google's best estimate. Um, and as of yesterday, I'll be honest, I did not check again today, uh, she's been cited 189,000 times. So that means people have mentioned her work in 189, more than 189,000, I'm rounding down. That's um, a lot of papers. That is a lot of papers. <laughs> so today, we are gathered to celebrate Dr. Moffat and her uh, award-winning idea uh, for the 2022 Grawmeyer Award in Psychology, and to hear her talk, History of an Idea, 1982 to 2022, Adolescence Limited and Life Course Persistent Antisocial Behavior. Please join me in welcoming our 2022 winner of the Glomer Award, uh, Award in Psychology, Dr. Terry Moffat. Thanks so much, Nick, for that lovely introduction. I could just listen to you all day. Uh, and thank you to everyone here who has risked your life to come out and hear a psychology lecture during the pandemic. So that's pretty special. Um, I want to just first check, Dr. Ross, can you hear me? You're yes. way there in the back. So, all right, if the sound is not good, let me know. Okay, uh, today what I'd like to do is tell you about the history of an idea that's been part of my scientific career from 1982 until today. Uh, so for the next 40 minutes, I'll tell you about how I learned about the difference between adolescence limited and life course persistent antisocial behavior. Now this is my PhD advisor, the late Sharnoff Mednick. He was the person who first talked me into studying crime and antisocial behavior when I was in grad school in the early 1980s. Now many of you here are going to be thinking, oh grown, this idea has been around for 40 years, what's in it for us? But I think you'll soon see that it, if you're close to the age of 17 to 25, it's all about you and people you know. Okay, so she comes with a problem with the microphone. Let me see. There we go. Okay. So this summarizes what psychologists knew about antisocial behavior at the time I started studying it. All the research then focused on males. It was assumed that crime by girls and women was far too rare to be interesting to anybody in science. Uh, the slide shows the prevalence of male antisocial behavior from preschool on the left all the way over to near midlife on the right. And I want you to first look at those red bars. What you can see on this slide is that the prevalence of antisocial behavior was about 5% in childhood and 5% again in adulthood, no matter how you measured it at any age. But there was something strange that happened during adolescence. And that's when the prevalence jumped sky high, and that's shown in yellow. So as a young psychologist, I thought these strange facts needed some kind of an explanation. So I decided to work on that. Now, also in the 1980s, the curve of the number of criminal offenses in America over the offender's age had just been published in the National Academy of Sciences report that was led by the guys you see here, Al Bloomstein and David Farrington and they later became mentors to me. So you can see that official crime starts at age 13 when kids can first get arrested and charged, and then it peaks when huge numbers of crimes are committed by 18-year-olds. And then it drops again to a low level in adulthood, and this curve applies, now we know, all around the world. In the 1980s, the big question was, why is there this peak in crime in the teenage years, and what kind of teenagers are doing all this crime. So I wanted to start studying a large number of young boys in childhood and then follow them through adolescence while they were climbing that mountain toward the peak age of crime. 
But as a newly minted PhD student, I had no grant money and I didn't have any track record, so nobody was going to let me start such an ambitious project. Uh, so to get around that big barrier, I moved to New Zealand, as you do, uh, where I was invited to join a team who had already been tracking a cohort of young children who had been growing up there since they were born in 1972. And I joined the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development Study. My goal at that time was to follow a cohort from the peak to the peak age of criminal offending and then out again into adulthood. And we've done it. Um, this year, in 2022, these children born in 1972 are having their 50th birthdays. And they're well out the other side of the age crime curve now. So I want to tell you a bit more about this study. So here's the design. Up at the top, you see we started with 1,037 babies. These were all the babies born in one city in one year in 19, that was 1972-73. No child was excluded. All were taken. Ethnically, this cohort is white European descent. If you look down the left side, you see the ages when we've collected data. On 13 occasions since babyhood, at every occasion, every study member uh, comes into our clinical setting uh, for a full day of private examinations and interviews. And then if you look down at the bottom on the yellow bit, it shows that we last saw them at age 45 in 2019. Luckily, we finished up right before the pandemic, so we did get to see everyone in person. 94% took part, and this means it's not the case that those who became involved in crime dropped out along the way. If you look at the really bot the very bottom line, you can see that we plan to be seeing them again at age 52, and we just received funding for this, so we're really very excited to get going. Now, by the time I got to New Zealand, in the 1,000 children had already been assessed six times, from birth to age 11. So we already knew virtually everything about their childhood, and that was including who was a very difficult baby, uh, who had conduct problems, who was aggressive in elementary school, and that was only about 5% of the boys, just as the psychologists had already reported in the literature. So uh, just as evidence that I really did go there, here I am in 1985 interviewing one of the study members who was a 13-year-old. Um, the children thought I was quite amusing with my American accent, um, but they were willing to tell me about their delinquent acts, uh, and they said that was because they knew I'd be going back to America and I wouldn't rat them out to their parents. So I collected data to measure the antisocial behavior and delinquent behavior in the study as the children grew through age 13 and then age 15, uh, and they were then approaching the peak age of crime. I collected reports about each child's behavior from the children, their parents, their teachers, and I also collected their police records too. And from my experience with these 1,000 teenagers, I developed the idea that's being recognized by the Grawmeyer Award today. Uh, the idea was really very simple. I noticed in my work there in New Zealand that lots of teenagers engaged in delinquent offending during their adolescent years. But this big group of teenage delinquents concealed two groups of kids who came to adolescence from two really very different childhood backgrounds. The blue illustrates a small group who had begun their antisocial behavior in very early childhood uh, as toddlers, and then they continued that through elementary school and into high school. And I thought this poor start in life would leave them with a high chance of continuing their antisocial style throughout their lives. So I called them the life course persistent offenders. Now, I predicted that although they are small in numbers, that they would offend for many years, and that means they would account for much of the crime rate over their lifetime. Now, a much larger group, who I called adolescence limited offenders, are shown on this slide in gray. Their childhoods were free of conduct problems or aggression because they first initiated offending when they hit puberty. So I predicted that they would leave crime, crime behind them when they became young adults. They would, go, uh, they would go along and break the law as teenagers, uh, but then go back to being good citizens. So I didn't have any data on the outcomes beyond age 15 yet, 
But I mentioned this idea in a child development paper in 1990. So that was the first time I wrote about it. Then the, the journal Psychological Review published my theoretical predictions in 1993. It was a really long paper, longest one I've ever written, and it was an equally long road to getting it accepted for publication. Editors kept saying, if you'll cut it in half, we'll take it. But I wanted the, the full idea in there. Um, today, it's been cited over 13,000 times. And this is pleasing to us because it means that the idea has been useful to other uh, researchers and policy makers. Now, the next slides I'm going to show you will show what the theory actually proposed. So this illustrates a social path down which a child might go to become a life course persistent offender. It begins with neurodevelopmental problems in earliest infancy, and then at each successive life stage, the child's behavior is met with some influence from his social environment, and that's shown on the right-hand side in blue. If the inputs from the environment are not healthy, then the child's antisocial development continues to snowball, becoming stronger and stronger. And that's depicted where the yellow arrows get bigger and bigger as the child grows older. So after a cumulative process of many years, this might culminate in a young man who has an antisocial personality disorder, which is very difficult to change. This slide illustrates an academic path down which a child might go to become a life course persistent offender. It also begins with neurodevelopmental problems in infancy. And again, at each life stage, the child's behavior is met with some influence from his social environment, shown on the right in blue. After many years of learning problems and school dropout and failed work experiences, this whole cumulative snowball process might culminate in a young man who can't get into the legitimate job market and believes he has very few alternatives to crime. Again, the snowball rolling downhill could be disrupted and set right at any point if the environmental inputs were healthy enough. Now, this slide is a thumbnail sketch of the theory behind offending that is called Adolescence Limited. Now, these children have a happy, healthy childhood, uh, and they build up good social bonds and good academic achievement. But when they reach puberty, they find themselves in a maturity gap. They feel biologically adult, but everyone around them is still treating them like a little kid. And at this point, it's tempting for many teenagers to experiment with delinquent behaviors just to prove their mettle and to prove to themselves that they can do it and break some apron strings. They can watch what the few life course persistent kids are doing, and they can mimic that. They can get involved in shoplifting and car theft and experimenting with drugs and vandalism and other kinds of minor crimes. And they virtually always do this in groups with their peers. But once they age into adulthood, they no longer need offending to prove themselves. And they have those good social skills and good grades that they built up before adolescence, so they can get a good partner and a good job, and then they can leave offending behind. So this was the theory. You're living this, so you know whether it sounds reasonable still to you today. Remember, this was the 1980s. So what were we measuring in the Dunedin study? We were measuring fighting, bullying, telling lies, stealing, uh, truancy, and destroying property. Um, and when they got older, out of school, and truancy was no longer relevant, we studied work absenteeism. Now, repeatedly, uh, we studied these things right across the years. And according to uh, reports that we collected from the teachers, their mothers, and each teenager's own self-reports as well. Uh, and we use these data in a type of analysis that is called trajectory analysis. Uh, and tra what trajectory analysis does is it tracks across repeated measurements in a longitudinal study to identify groups of people who are following the same trajectory of behavior over time. Now, this slide shows you the results of that model in the Dunedin set, uh, study data set up to age 15. Uh, so I want you to look down at the bottom. You'll see in purple about half of the kids only ever had low levels of conduct problems. And then as we expected, 
The data yielded a small group who were always engaging in high levels of conduct problems, and they're shown up at the top in red. And then according to the theory, they were on a life course persistent track. And also as expected, we found a larger group that was shown here in blue, which only started to develop conduct problems when they were teenagers. Now, according to the theory, they were on an adolescence limited track. Now you're gonna notice that there's a small green group too. Uh, this was a surprise group to me. I had not anticipated them. Uh, they had conduct problems when they first started school, but they quickly grew out of that. Uh, so I'll say a little more about them later. They're interesting. So at this point in my career, I was an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and I was trying to explain the life course persistent and adolescence limited groups uh, to my students using this butterfly metaphor. So you have here two species of butterflies, they look the same, but the monarch is poisonous, whereas the admiral is actually nutritious and not poisonous at all, at least to birds. The admiral is a mimic that looks like the monarch in order to scare birds away. But if you want to tell the difference between these two butterflies, it's necessary to look at an earlier stage of life when they're still caterpillars. So silly metaphor, but it gives you the idea of the importance of childhood. So to do this in the Dunedin study, we compared the adolescence limited and life course persistent groups uh, in the cohort on childhood risk factors that had been measured at an earlier stage of life from birth through childhood. And next I'm gonna show you graphs of the levels of risk that they had. But first here are a few tips on how to read these graphs I'm gonna show you. The numbers are scaled so that what's normal for the population is the zero midpoint. This, measure, this means that we compared each offender group to the average boy who was growing up in New Zealand. And on the right of this slide, it shows you that the difference between groups can be considered small, medium, or large on this scale. Now, I'll explain this a little more as we go along but these, this is a scale that applies to all uh, psychological science. So this shows you levels on measures of neurodevelopmental risk for the life course persistent boys as compared to that zero point, which is up the middle of the vertical line up the middle of the slide. Uh, it represents the average boy. Now the life course persistent group scored worse on these risks and the differences were moderate to large. Each chart I'm gonna show you will include a lot of different measures like this. Here we see neurological examinations uh, at age three, uh, IQ test scores given in elementary school, reading level, and so forth. On the next chart, I'm not gonna read out every single measure. Uh, I just want you to get the overall gist of how abnormal these boys' childhoods were from their earliest year when we compare them to the average boy growing up in their country. So these are the childhood behavior problems, temperament and behavior risk of the boys on the life course persistent track. Uh, things like being a difficult baby, uh, being hyperactive, getting in lots of fights. Now you'll remember that fighting was one of the behaviors that we used to define the groups on our trajectory model uh, from age seven to 15, but this fighting reported here by parents and teachers was in kindergarten. So on every measure, they looked extreme. And these are their parenting risk factors. The effect sizes here are again, medium to large. They include things like poor discipline by the parents, uh, constant family conflict between mother and father, and domestic violence at home, mothers with mental health problems, and other kinds of characteristics of the parents in the family. So if you remember the theory of the social path that I showed you, these troubled boys were not getting healthy input at home from their social environment to correct their childhood uh, problem behaviors. Now this slide summarizes all of that, what you just saw, uh, but all in one place. I'd like you to keep it in your mind because next we're gonna make a comparison of the same data for the boys who were on the adolescence limited trajectory. Okay, got it in your mind? So here are the childhoods of the boys on the adolescence limited track. The adolescence limited group scored near the vertical zero point, suggesting their levels of risk were normal. 
They were typical of ordinary boys their age in New Zealand. No real significant risk problem of their own or in their family. If you look down at the bottom, you see the delinquency of the boys' peers, their friends at age 13 and age 18. As we predicted, this group's main risk process involved hanging out with other teenagers who were engaging in delinquency. And this was according to the boys' own self-reports, but also their mother's and teacher's self-reports about their friends. Now about this time, and now we're up to the late 1990s, uh, psychologists were starting to worry a lot more about girls. Uh, police and courts were reporting more teenage girls were appearing in the juvenile justice system. It was all over the newspapers. And then everyone began to really regret that crime research had been focused on boys only <coughs> for so long. So Afshalom Kasti and I, Afshalom is here, uh, he's my long-term collaborator and my husband, we published this book that analyzed all the data for the 500 girls in the Dunedin cohort. And it's, this little book is full of amazing findings, uh, and I can't go into detail about them, uh, but I'll just say that we found that the life course persistence pattern was far more common in males than in uh, females. It just didn't seem to apply to girls very well. But we also found that lots of girls followed the adolescence limited pattern. They were good kids in childhood, but then they started to get into trouble after they hit puberty. And here for adolescence limited, the male-female ratio was almost equal. So large numbers of adolescence limited, small numbers of life course persistent girls. This was the graph of childhood risk that we found for that very small group of delinquent girls who fit the life course persistent path. Uh, they resembled the persistent boy offenders in their childhood risks. And this was the graph of childhood risk we found for the majority of delinquent girls. Uh, they were generally at low risk as children. They most resemble the adolescence limited boy offenders in their childhood and also in their patterns of offending as teenagers. Now, you will of course realize that we still had no idea how these young people in Dunedin were going to turn out when they reached adulthood. <clears throat> I had predicted that those who started conduct problems youngest would continue offending the longest, but I actually had no evidence that this would be true. So I was on rather thin ice for keeping my job at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and lots of prayers were going up at that time. Um, this big outcome question was depicted very nicely in this rather alarming illustration that you see here from the Washington Post. The newspaper had covered a talk that I gave at the National Institute of Justice in Washington then. So now we're up to the young adult years of the Dunedin study. We kept on collecting data until they were 26 years old. And by now, we had enough waves of measurement to update our trajectory, anal trajectory analyses. And I'm showing you a picture of uh, Candace Audert because when she was a postdoctoral fellow on our team, she was instrumental in this uh, statistical modeling work. Uh, Candace nominated me for the Grawmeyer Award, and I'm very grateful. She's a wonderful senior researcher now herself at the University of California at Irvine. So we added the girls in and we updated the model. And once again, look down at the bottom, and you'll see in purple about half of the study members in Dunedin, the 1,000 study members, still had low levels of conduct problems as they grew up. And again, the data yielded a very small group who were always engaging in high levels of conduct problems, a life course persistent track shown at the top in red. And then again, we found that larger group shown here in yellow now who were on an adolescence limited track. There was also that small green group too, and this was that pesky surprise group again that I hadn't anticipated. They had conduct problems when they first started school, according to teachers and mothers, but they quickly grew out of those. Now, I want you to look on the right-hand side, far right-hand side of this chart at age uh, 26. Uh, at age 26, according to their self-reports when we interviewed them, the life course persistent group and the adolescence limited group were both still offending at about the same rate. But 
When we considered the types of crimes they reported in our interviews, the adolescents' limited groups' crimes were relatively minor. For example, the adolescents' limited study members were smoking a lot of cannabis and shoplifting a lot. But the life course persistent group were selling drugs and breaking into houses to commit burglary. So we got a qualitatively different picture of what they were doing in lawbreaking at age 26. Now this slide reinforces that notion. So here we report the official records held by the New Zealand police for convictions in criminal court. So the life course persistent group is shown as usual in red. Uh, they showed engagement in lawbreaking that tended to be of a more serious nature and therefore brought them more convictions by the courts, especially drug trafficking and violent crimes. And by age 26, they had already spent more months behind bars as well. Now, we also collected data on antisocial behaviors in the context of their families. By age 26, the Dunedin study members were old enough to be pairing off uh, with girlfriends, and many were having children. Uh, the life course persistent males, shown in red, were engaged in more physical intimate violence towards their partners, and they were also more controlling of their partners with humiliating, restricting, stalking, that kind of thing towards women. They reported that they more often had hit a child in anger beyond what was warranted for normal discipline of a child, and men in both groups were often absent fathers. They had left their children to be raised by their ex-partners, but we found that the life force persistent group had twice as many children by age 26 as the adolescence limited group. So we looked at their work lives at 26, as 26 year olds, and as we anticipated, the persistent offenders shown in red were having more difficulties making their way in the labor force. They had gotten very little education, they held unskilled occupations, they got in lots of conflicts at work, um, and so forth. So criminologists know already that the two things that help an offender reform are, does anybody know what those are? A good woman and a good job. But our persistent offenders were taking their antisocial style into their relationships with women and into their workplaces as well. Now, I promised to tell you about those boys in the green trajectory, those conduct problem boys who acted out in first grade but did not go on to become uh, delinquent or criminal offenders. Now, many psychologists in the field got really excited about this unexpected group. They wanted to find out if they were the magic key to discovering, uh, uncovering protective factors. What enabled them to overcome their uh, brief aggressive behavior when they were in first grade. But the first thing we realized we needed to find out was, were they really recoveries who had become uh, fine, upstanding citizens? And unfortunately, the answer is not. Um, they were definitely not living a criminal lifestyle as young adults, but they were anxious and phobic. They tended to be loners who did not have partners or children. They scored high on personality tests of neuroticism and introversion. Um, and they tended to be living on social welfare support or to have, if they had a job, it was a low status job. So some of them had one or two convictions in court, but these tended to be for minor offenses such as vagrancy or trespassing or peeping Tom. So this fit with findings from other leading studies at the time. Lee Robbins had written in her classic book, Deviant Children Grown Up, in 1966, half of boys with conduct disorder do not develop antisocial, antisocial personality disorder as adults, but most of them develop some other adjustment problems. And David Farrington wrote about conduct problem boys in his follow-up study, there were no real adult success stories. So by now, uh, the American Psychiatric Association had encoded the childhood onset versus adolescent onset distinction in its diagnostic criteria for conduct disorder um, to be used in childhood mental health clinics. And that was great recognition of the idea, 
for clinical practice, but it was actually quite hard to implement it. Clinicians were left with a dilemma. So if you're a therapist and a very young child is brought to you for aggressive behavior, how can you tell if he's on a track to become a life course persistent offender in the future who really needs urgent early treatment or not? So a clinician would not have a crystal ball to see into their patient's future. Now at this point, there were some hints coming out from other people's studies of twins and adoptees, and they were reporting that inherited risk applied to life course persistent antisocial behavior, but not so much to childhood limited or adolescence limited antisocial behavior. And to us, uh, this genetic risk suggested that a background of problem behavior in parents and grandparents might be something that clinicians could assess in order to help them make a better diagnosis. So in 2006, we undertook to collect data on each of the 1,000 Dunedin study members' family members. Uh, we collected medical histories and psychiatric histories. We interviewed their parents, visited them at home, and interviewed them separately. And we gathered information on over 8,000 relatives of the Dunedin study members. And what we found about the life course persistent offenders is shown here. Uh, overwhelmingly, a family psychiatric history distinguished children on the life course persistent path from all of the other groups. Both childhood limited and adolescence limited had near normal family histories. We were even able to get this kind of good discrimination between the groups by using just a couple of simplistic questions about whether any of the child's four grandparents had an alcohol problem. That's something that clinicians can easily ask parents as part of the intake interview in a child mental health clinic. So this was a nice contribution to clinical practice. So by now we're up to the study members 30s and their 40s and it's you know it's a fact of longitudinal research like this that as fast as we scientists can collect the data and analyze the data and write our books the study members keep growing older and older relentlessly they never stop getting older and we have to scramble to keep up with them and write new interviews and develop new ways of collecting data to fit their new lifestyles. So uh, we searched the men's official crime records again, and here I'm showing you their uh, convictions after age 26. They've continued to diverge, uh, the groups have. This should be the desistance period when the adolescence limited group of offenders leave crime behind, uh, and it looks like it is. Uh, the adolescence limited men are on the left, and they're now being convicted at rates much lower than the life course persistent men on the right both for property crime, shown in blue, and violent crime, shown in yellow. And remind, just to remind you, these are convictions after they were age 26, so well after the peak age of crime. Now, for many years, biology and crime has been one of the most heatedly debated topics in the behavioral sciences. Uh, you'll remember that the theory back in, 19, in the 1990s put forward a neurodevelopmental hypothesis about how the offender groups differed back then. But technology to test this was not available uh, at the time. Now it can be tested because we're able to use new data technologies three decades later. So today psychologists can incorporate genome-wide genetics and uh, magnetic resonance imaging brain images into their research and so did we at the Dunedin study. So I had hypothesized that the life course persistent offenders would have a stronger familial genetic load of risk that would contribute to their antisocial behavior development. So 25 years later, advances in genetics allowed us to move beyond studies of twins and adoptees and family history in order to test this hypothesis with actual genomes. So we did this work using something called the Education Polygenic Score. And here's what it is, I'll explain it. So over one million people have provided their DNA by mailing a saliva sample to places like 23andMe. People here have done this perhaps, 23andMe? 
So that's a very common thing for people to do these days. They also, when they fill in the website, state their level of education. Now, all of these data can be used to perform a genome-wide association study. The whole genome was searched for markers that associate with levels of education, from low to high. These genetic markers are, that were found were then summed to create the polygenic score for educational attainment. This is not work I did, it's work that other researchers did. What's important is I want you to take on board, this score taps anything that is relevant for going far in education. Um, intellectual skills, of course, that's really important for going far in education, but also characteristics such as self-control and attention that are necessary for success at school. And what we did was we derived this polygenic score in each of the 1,000 Sweden study members' DNA. Now, psychologists have known, you're wondering, why are they using a score for education? Well, psychologists have known for many years that school failure is a key factor uh, involved in the causal pathway to a life of crime. If you remember that academic pathway that I showed you in the life course persistent theory. So we tested the hypothesis that study members who have the lowest number of genes associated with educational success in school would also be the most likely to become life course persistent offenders. And they were. So here are our familiar four groups of Dunedin study members. The red bar shows you the life course persistent offenders had the lowest level on the education polygenic score. Now, and the others were near average. We realized that this finding was likely to be highly controversial. And we realized that it would be particularly unwelcome by many academic criminologists. And for that reason, we wanted to make sure that the finding was reproducible before we studied it. So we tested it in another cohort that we've been following. And now we need to leave New Zealand in your mind and travel to Britain in order to meet this cohort. So here I'm introducing you to a cohort that we started in Britain in the 1990s. It's called the Environmental Risk Study. Um, it repeats the Dunedin study, but with 2,200 British children born in 1995. And it adds even more in-depth measures of their environment while they were growing up. Now, the Dunedin study convicted offenders, our offenders are shown on the left. Uh, the data are in green and the E-risk cohort data are on the right in blue. And what you see here is a pretty solid replication across two cohorts of children born 20 years apart and 20,000 kilometers apart. Now the E-risk cohort was only 19 years old when we collected their crime conviction records from the British Ministry of Justice. Um, but those who already have a conviction record by age 19 also had the lowest average number of markers on the polygenic score for educational achievement. Now, taken together, these two studies showed evidence that actual genes that are present at a baby's conception are involved in some way in the child's risk for entering a life of crime. But the prevention message is a bit different here from what most people would suspect. I think the finding about the education polygenic score points to young people's problems with learning, with attention, and self-control. Those problems are probably uh, things that brought them experiences of failure and humiliation and rejection in school. So it suggests that systems of schooling and education could be a good vehicle for preventing young people's entry into a life of crime. Now, Let's change a bit to the brain. Now, in the years from 2017 to 2019, we added MRI neuroimaging to the Dunedin study. And we have tested the measures of the structure of the brain against the Dunedin study trajectory groups. This slide reports that the life course of persistent uh, group had smaller surface area of their brains at age 45 on average compared to the low antisocial group. That's that purple group who were never very antisocial all the way across life. The surface of the brain for this kind of, of research is divided into 360 parcels. 
and the blue shows you which surface areas, which of those parcels, pass a strict, what's called a fault discovery test. That is the significant group difference between the life force persistent group and the low offending group exceeds what could possibly be found by chance. These brain areas were spread, as you can see here, all over the surface of the brain. And that suggests that there's no one little part of the brain that's involved, uh, but instead um, there's an overall slightly smaller brain size, very slightly smaller. And it was important to compare the life course persistent group in the to the adolescence limited group as well. And this slide shows that the life course persistent uh, group also had smaller surface area than the adolescence limited group on average. And the adolescence limited group brain surface area did not differ on average from the low antisocial group. Their brains looked normal in size. Now we're also, we also separately tested what are called the brain subcortical gray matter structures. And these are structures that are deep beneath the brain surface. They're shown here in color. Many of them uh, have to do with how we experience emotion. The volumes of many of these structures were smaller than the, for the life course persistent group. And that's shown in the dark navy blue. So their lines are going to the left, suggesting that they're smaller. Again, the outcomes were spread right throughout the brain. There was no one specific brain structure involved. And the adolescence limited and low antisocial group, again, look healthy. They're light blue and gray, and their brains are quite healthy for their age. Do keep in mind, these brain scans were taken after a life of crime. So they don't tell us at what age the brain differences emerged. We don't know that. So we see an important message that adds a kind of a new nuance to the, the quarrels and debates in science about the biology and crime. So only the very small minority of offenders who showed antisocial behavior uh, starting in childhood and con continuing throughout their lives had any difference in genetics or brain structure. The majority of offenders who broke the law as young people did not. So at this point, we're well into midlife with the Dunedin study members. All of the study members, even the persistent group, are doing less crime than they did as teenagers. They're following that downward curve of crime over age. But living an antisocial lifestyle for decades might have biological consequences for them. So I'm going to wind up by showing you some aging outcomes. Keep in mind that the findings I'll show you now will control for each person's history of tobacco smoking. So we're setting that aside, um, although the offenders do smoke more than other people. And we're also going to control for a large number of childhood health measures. And that means that the aging outcomes I'll show you do indicate decline from a former peak of useful health earlier in life. So in the study, we invest in facial photographs. And we do this in order to study the effects of aging on um, skin and facial structure and uh, facial tissues. So these photos are blended digital composites of 10 women and 10 men. These are study members who were photographed within two months of their 45th birthday. And they look pretty young. They look good. But these cohort members here are age 45 too. These are digital composites of the 10 fastest aging women and fastest aging men in the cohort. Now we brought these, do, these uh, photographs back to Duke University and had undergraduate students rate the age of each study member by looking at their photo. We didn't tell the students that they were all 45. They just had to guess how old they thought they looked. They thought that everybody looked kind of older uh, than them. But here you see that the photos of the life course persistent group, as always shown in red, were judged to look years older than the other groups, according to our Duke students. Now, it was important to go just beyond you know, surface photographs in order to measure aging with greater precision. 
Uh, so the study has been tracking 19 biomarkers, and these represent the function of multiple organ systems throughout the body. We've been tracking them for the last 20 years, from age 26, 32, 38, and 45. The markers range from things like periodontal measures, gum disease, to cardio fitness, to pre-diabetes lab tests like HbA1c. Uh, we looked for decline over time in these markers that was gradual and synchronized. That would represent the whole body's gradual biological aging. Now this slide shows you that the biomarkers did indeed tend to show gradual progressive coordinated deterioration of physiological integrity from age 26 to 32 to 38 to 45. For those of you who are in this age range, you see yourself here sort of slowly falling apart. And it's happening in the population, although hopefully not in your faces yet. Um, so we modeled these data to give each study member a score for how fast they personally have been biologically aging. And this shows the results. The horizontal black line shows that the average study member has been aging one biological year for every one chronological year. That's how you should age. You know? That's normal and healthy. That's how we should all be doing it. But the persistent antisocial group has been aging biologically 1.2 years per year since they were 26. That is, as adults, they've been aging biologically 14 months every year. And that's catching up with them now as they're growing older. Now we give the Dunedin study members a large number of tests that are sensitive to aging from uh, the science of gerontology. And I'm going to show you just two of those. One of the first physical functions that will, that will go as we enter old age is our balance. So we tested how long they could stand still on one leg with their eyes closed. Very simple test of balance. And the life course persistent group already has problems with their balance, although they're only 45. We also study sensory functions, hearing and vision. Uh, this test that you see here is for how well study members could hear one voice speaking when there was a lot of background noise. So if they're older uh, gentlemen here in this audience, you will know that this is what makes it unpleasant for you to be in a noisy restaurant or a noisy birthday party where a lot of people are talking all at once. It's hard to follow the conversation. So we found that the life course persistent group already has problems with hearing speech in noise. Their hearing is okay, but once you add that extra cognitive load of lots of people talking at once, they have difficulty. And they're only 45. Now, I've shown you many findings over the lives of the Dunedin study members from birth to adulthood. Many of these findings we summarized in this book that we published in 2020. It's called The Origins of Youth. And if you've enjoyed this presentation, the book's an easy way for you to learn more. And I've taken you on a gallop through findings from our own Dunedin study and our own ERISC study in Britain. But since 1993, the idea has been studied by multiple teams in 16 other countries. Um, and there's a very large literature now, uh, indeed. And if you're interested, I've reviewed it in these publications. Uh, there's also a group uh, at the uh, criminal, uh, School of Criminology at the University of Cincinnati, many of whom live across the line in Kentucky, who have been studying this theory in different ethnic groups in the United States and showing how it applies to people of different ethnic backgrounds. So what are the implications for life course persistent offenders? They do account for half the crime rates. They are small in numbers, but they have a disproportionate cost to society and their families. Their early onset recommends uh, early childhood as the time for primary prevention. They didn't get a fair start of life as a small child right out of the starting blocks. Their neurodevelopmental problems recommend public health approaches to reduce um, infant neurodevelopmental problems in young babies. And intervention should take a multimodal approach involving the child, but also the family, the school, and the justice system. And we need to think of this as a chronic cumulative condition, uh, and these kinds of things need lifelong sustained intervention. 
they're expensive. We also have some implications for adolescents limited offenders. They account for the other half of the crime rate, so it's important to intervene to reduce their offending too. But they're very good candidates for positive change because they establish healthy attachment bonds and good school achievement before they became involved in offending. So what intervention should do for this group is try to stop the deviant peer influence on them during adolescence and try to prevent snares that might retard their natural inclination towards distance from crime. Snares are things like getting an addiction, losing out on education, or getting an official conviction record that stops you getting a job. When they get arrested, diverting them away from conviction in jail will give them the best chance to reform on their own. Now, um, I'm often asked what impact this idea has had. This was very important to the jury of the Grawmeyer uh, Award. They were very keen to know exactly how the idea had real-world impact. So the impact of an idea from psychology research can actually be quite difficult to identify. There is research out there that show, has tracked that, and it shows it takes 17 years on average for a scientific finding to make any kind of difference in the real world, in clinical practice or policy. And it's difficult to trace the provenance of an idea, too, because once people start, you know, policymakers start using an idea, they quit citing the original academic publications uh, and just use the idea for what it, uh, what it is. So we were pleased with this recognition shown here, uh, especially with the quotation that came with this award. It was for improving the lives of young people in conflict with the law around the world. I like that very much. And it's also very hard for researchers to control the use of their work. So I want to tell you about that uh, in just a minute. Uh, a good example has been the U.S. Supreme Court uh, decisions that have paid attention uh, to this idea. So there was one decision that uh, debated the death penalty for juveniles. That was in 2004. And then life without parole for juveniles was debated by the Supreme Court in 2009 and 2017. And what's interesting to me is that in these decisions, my research findings and this idea were involved, but they were involved to argue on both sides of the question, both for and against. So, example, in the case of Roper versus Simmons, the attorneys who were against severe adult sentences argued that my work shows that juveniles who commit violent crimes have neurodevelopmental deficits from early childhood and learning problems, and this disability should stop them from being tried in an adult court. So then they would not be eligible for an adult sentence. But the attorneys who, who were arguing for severe adult sentences used my work and this idea to argue that juveniles who commit violent crimes are much more likely to continue offending in the future, and so to protect the public from crime, they should be given the strictest possible sentence. So often, the way in which research has impact is completely beyond the control of the research team. Now, just last week, as I was preparing this lecture, I got this nice email from a judge uh, in New Jersey, and he wrote, your research helped me make the most difficult decision that I have faced in my 20 years on the bench, whether to sentence a 16-year-old to life without parole. The central issue was whether his youth should be considered in mitigation. It's nice to get letters like this that tell you that people in the justice system are using the idea. So I'd like to just end by saying a, a huge thank you to my research team who are based at Duke University and King's College London uh, and also at the University of Otago in New Zealand and also to the late Charles Grawmeyer and his family for whom this award is named uh, and the jury who selected this idea uh, and to all of you, uh, kind and brave audience members uh, for coming out and for your patience and your attention. Thanks very much. We may be out of time, are we? <laughs> we have time.
time for maybe one question, maybe two. <laughs> Any, ba any brave yeah, person got one question? Let's have it. So just to clarify, in the New Zealand study, the way you measured antisocial behavior was by asking the subjects themselves, right? We, we asked the study members in interviews, but we also sent questionnaires to their teachers, and we did surveys with their mothers as well, and then we collected their crime records okay. as well. So do you think the subjects were more inclined to avoid antisocial behavior because they knew their behavior was being studied? Ah, interesting. Okay, great question, great question. So what we did to answer that question was compare their uh, crime records against uh, the whole country, and they're the same. So they have not uh, straightened up because they knew that they were being um, surveilled by me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would have done that if I was Ben. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, taking part in research actually doesn't change people's lives very much. If it did, we would be able to you know, improve people's lives by just enrolling, enrolling them in a research project. But any of you who have ever taken part uh, in a research project will know that you, know, you quickly walk out the door and forget about it. Yeah. Hello. Uh, was there any difference in socioeconomic status between the boys that you studied? Uh, yes. The, the boys who were in the life course persistent group did come from poorer homes as compared to those in the adolescence limited group who were more middle class backgrounds. And uh, how do you think that would have affected the outcomes of the, uh, of the uh, study? I think that the, it, uh, it's part and parcel of that not getting a fair shake out of the starting blocks. In early childhood, they're, you know, they're born with some kind of learning difficulties and uh, maybe their mother has a mental illness and, and when the family has no financial resources, that's part of that poor environmental input that doesn't help to set them right. It, it could be that those children who were on that recovery path, the green group who had conduct problems early on and then came right, actually their families might have had uh, more resources. Uh, but they weren't, you wouldn't say they were really middle class, but uh, their parents might have cared about them more. Right. Thank you. Awesome. Were there any cultural differences that could have impacted the study? Any cultural differences? Yes. Uh, can you say more about what you mean? Like, oh, my bad. Yeah. Um, like how in some cultures there are some culturally acceptable things that aren't usually seen as a problem and others there aren't. Like were there any cultural differences that could have impacted the study? Aha, uh -huh, right, okay, good question. So this is an opportunity to remind you that the, the sample were of European, white European descent, mostly Scottish and Irish, kind of like people in North Carolina. Um, so I don't think that the culture of growing up in New Zealand is so very different from our own. And for example, Gini coefficients for social inequalities are the same for New Zealand and the United States. So their rich to poor divide is, is similar and so forth. And we did not have a lot of people of, uh, uh, people of uh, Maori or Polynesian uh, descent who were in our particular uh, study. Culturally though, one of the funny things that I found when I first got there were there were certain crimes that people in New Zealand thought were much more serious than Americans thought. So I had the police officers rate uh, how they, serious they thought the crimes were. And in the South Island of New Zealand, trespassing is an extremely severe crime for a young person. And that is because where they trespass is into the sheep farm, and that causes the sheep to miscarry and ruins the uh, economics of the South Island. So, you know, we don't worry about trespassing here, but to them, it's a bad thing. Thank you. Were there any um, surprising outliers, such as members of the LCP group uh, suddenly straightening out later in life, or some of those in the low-risk group all of a sudden like committing a serious offense at age 30 or something? Uh, there have been some serious offenses emerging in first-time adult onset offenders, and those tend to be middle-life drunk driving. <laughs> yeah, so you know, you know guys who have lived their whole lives doing uh, all the right things, and then they they uh, start to realize that they're going to get old and they get a red Italian sports car, car and they go completely crazy. 
And I think that might be what we're seeing in some of those surprise uh, adult onset convictions, but they tend to be in the realm of drunk driving. Thanks. This will be the last question. Uh, yes, hello. Um, how would you predict if uh, the results if you were to have, uh, instead of white European uh, New Zealanders, instead of uh, maybe black and indigenous African Americans, if you were to do the same study? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, a, uh, I'm sorry, we're on our last question, we don't have much time, but uh, this was the part that when I tried to first publish that very long paper in 1993, I had a big section on, uh, on race because no serious theory about crime can ignore the race situation. Um, and the editors made me take it out. So they didn't want to publish that. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. And many people said I hadn't thought about race, but I had. So uh, what I had said in those pages that didn't make it into publication was that you would expect more of both kinds of offenders in an African-American population if they were poor, so not so much middle class uh, African-Americans, because they would have more, because of the structural ra racism history in the United States, they would have more of all the risk factors. So more um, uh, premature birth, more neurodevelopmental problems, more uh, uh, parents in jail, all of those kinds of things on those charts that were showing the, the environmental kinds of risk problems that they would have uh, would apply more to a disadvantaged ethnic minority uh, group. Um, so I never got to test that because, as you see, my studies are white as the driven snow in New Zealand and in, in Britain. Um, but uh, teams in California and, um, and Rochester, New York, and Cincinnati uh, and different places in the United States have tested them and are finding uh, that the findings look pretty darn similar across ethnic groups. Although I think more there's more chance of going to jail if you're an, an African-American adolescence limited kid, uh, and then that sort of is a snare that might uh, be hard for you to overcome. All right, uh, thank you all for your uh, wonderful questions. Thank you, Dr. Vermont, for your presentation. Uh, that concludes our, our program for today. Uh, I would invite you, if you're able, to join us for a reception at the uh, planetarium just right across the way. Uh, but thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>